the other two co-chairs in case anybody has any questions afterwards. Uh, Dr. Drew Ivers from Webster City here in the red tie and David Fisher uh, waving his hand back here by the bar area. It's really a, a great time to be an American with all the challenges we have in front of us and I think when we look at the candidates that are currently running for president, we have a candidate here today that really stands apart from a lot of the other candidates in the field. Many of the candidates talk about voting against increasing the debt ceiling, but there's only one candidate that voted against all the spending in the first place, and that's Congressman Ron Paul. I'd like you guys to show me a little bit of an applause if, if what I have to say is something you agree with. Are you looking for a president who will follow the Constitution? Are you looking for a president who will respect your Second Amendment rights and who understands that the Constitution was written to protect and defend your liberty? who's been married to the same woman for over 50 years and practices his faith through his life. I'm hearing a lot of applause. And, and I'd like an applause if you're coming to Ames on August 13th to kick off the presidential campaign of Ron Paul in Ames, Iowa, my hometown. <laughs> Ames is a, a critical juncture for the campaign, and we do have tickets here today, discounted tickets. They're $10 each. On your way out, if you would see Steve Beerfeld and his staff, uh, they're selling tickets. I know a lot of you probably bought tickets on the way in. Uh, they're $10. We do have busing from Scott County and surrounding counties, so for those of you who are unable to drive to Ames, we do have transportation for you, so don't let that be uh, something that holds you back. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce the champion of the Constitution, Dr. Ron Paul. freedom because I think that's what we need a lot more of in this country. There's been a lot of talk, especially this past week or two or three, uh, about raising the debt limit so we don't default. And uh, much has been said about what it would be like if we defaulted. But there was never any real concern on my part that the uh, debt limit wouldn't be raised and that uh, we wouldn't default in the way of not sending out the checks and paying for the notes and paying the interest. That was never a thought. But what I am concerned about is the constant defaulting of our government. Because right now, we default by devaluing the currency, which is much, much more dangerous. And that hasn't changed. That has been made much worse because we are just like those individuals who are trying to get out of a hole and dig a hole bigger for ourselves. I never could understand the proposal that for the people who say the debt is the problem, so let's raise the debt limit to $2.4 trillion. I found that to not make any sense. That is the reason I voted against it. very unique and very bad for the markets if we defaulted in, in the way that they implied. The truth is that our country has defaulted many times on us. It, the very 
first time that it was a dramatic default was in, in the 1930s, in a bad economic times, when they literally took the gold from the American people. And if you had a gold certificate and you go to the government, it says promise to pay one ounce of gold for $20, the government just defaulted and ushered in the age of, uh, of welfareism. I mean, significant changes occurred in the 1930s. But then once again, uh, even though Americans weren't allowed to own gold in 1971, we, had, we were still promising that foreigners could turn in $35 and get an ounce of gold. Well, in 1971, the gold window was closed. We went off the pseudo gold standard, so we defaulted once again. In 1965, if you had a silver certificate, you no longer could go in and get an, a, a silver dollar. So once again, the government defaulted on us. So the default uh, is real. It's been done before. If we would not have raised the debt limit, that would have been messy, but it might have called the attention to all the politicians and all the people of this country that we have to change our ways. And today, we are continuing the default. Every time you go to the store or the gas station or whatever, if you think prices are going up, the government is defaulting on you because they're devaluing the currency. Today, we have a dollar that is worth two cents compared to the dollar that the Federal Reserve inherited in 1913. 1913 wasn't a very good year. We ended up getting the income tax and the Federal Reserve, and as far as I'm concerned, we don't need either one. But somehow or another, we have to cut off the spending. The appetite for spending is still there. Yes, the politicians are spending, and the markets want more spending, and everybody thinks that's what we have to continue to do. But the truth is, is that uh, it will change, because this cannot be sustained. We're, we're too much in debt, and you can't just keep borrowing and printing money. The worst thing about the destruction of a currency, which is the big concern economically that I have, is that it destroys the middle class. And uh, this is a characteristic of the devaluation of the currency. We now have a dollar that's worth two cents on the dollar the Federal Reserve inherited in 1913. The Federal Reserve was designed for, because they said that we, they should give us stable prices and full employment. And look at what they've given us. Unemployment, constant business cycle, a recession, depression now, that may turn out to be the worst in our history, and some very, very serious conditions. So it has been a total failure. It, it failed, I think, very simply, because the people in charge for the last 100 years didn't understand and didn't care and didn't obey the Constitution. The Constitution is explicit. Only gold and silver can be legal tender, and if we'd have done more of that, we would not have had this type of problem that we have today. people get a little bit confused on that. How does the Federal Reserve have anything to do with spending? It, it's because members of Congress don't have to be responsible, and the people who are demanding the programs are involved, too, because they get reelected by asking the government for more and more. So the politician votes for the program, and then they tax a bit, but there's never enough. Then they borrow a bit, and there's still never enough, and interest rates tend to go up. So what they do is they send the Treasury bills and the bonds to the Federal Reserve, and they create money out of thin air. And they buy these bonds, so that artificially creates an, 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 a, a boom, a, a bubble. And uh, it is predictable, it's been predictable by the Austrian free market economists. So it was not a surprise to any of us about what happened in 2008. It was destined to happen. But the most important thing to remember is you can't solve that problem we faced in 2008, which came from too much spending, too much borrowing, too much debt, too much regulations, too much printing press money. So we finally, it finally dawns on us that there's a major crisis. So what do we do in Washington, the Federal Reserve? We spend more money, borrow more money, print more money, write more regulations. Then they wonder why we haven't come out of the recession. Well, let me tell you, it's what has happened today is very predictable, less predictable, because we don't need that kind of policy. What we have to do is think about what this country is all about. This country was started in a desire to restrain the, the British king, because the king 
was uh, too interfering with our lives and, and the lives of the colonists and the uh, economy. So they wanted to redefine the role of government. So that's what the Constitution was all about. Redefining the government, saying that the government was there to protect our liberties and to preserve to, and to preserve the free marketplace at the same time, to restrain the government. That's what the Constitution is supposed to do. But what if we ended up with, we have a government that acts in secrecy and your privacy is totally violated constantly. We have it turned upside down. We need to reverse that. We need to think about valuing the Fourth Amendment. We need to think about, what does this Patriot Act mean? What does this mean when we go to the airports and have what happens to us with, with no, uh, no need to, that there's no probable cause? So what we as a people need to do is demand our freedom back. That's what we do. frequently on those who are, you know, um, well intended in saying, well, in order to get out of this, what we need is more sacrifice. We need you to sacrifice and you to sacrifice. And you know, I don't, I don't buy into that. I don't think sacrificing anything is beneficial for you. You don't need to sacrifice your liberties and you don't need to sacrifice any more your money. What we need to do is get the government out of the business of taking care of the special interests. Let them sacrifice, not the American people who are getting bills. This is what happened when the crisis was uh, very evident in 2008. Who made all the money when the bubble was being blown up and people were making money on the derivatives and trading and Wall Street and the banks and they were making billions of dollars. And uh, then the crisis hit and they go into bank. They should, you know, they become bankrupt. They're so involved and they tell the people. Well, you know what? If we don't bail them out, the country's going to suffer and we're going to have an economic calamity. So the Congress and the Federal Reserve go to town and bail out all the wealthy people. And what happened to the people? What happened to the middle class? The middle class, too many of them lost their jobs and they lost their houses. So this sort of confirms the fact that the Austrian free market economists always said and teach that if you have a destruction of a currency through inflation, through the printing press of money, you wipe out the middle class. And that is a threat to America, and it's a threat to our standard of living. Because we were the freest nation ever, and we were the most prosperous nation ever, and we had a large middle class, and that we're losing. In the last 10 years, we've essentially had no new jobs. Jobs are going overseas, our country is poor, it's all based on borrowing, and all based on debt. So there's going to be a major decision made by us. The people of this country have to decide, once again, what the role of government is. It should be. Just as the colonists decided what the role of government should have been way back. And I don't think the problem is that difficult. I like the idea that government should be there and very small and that people should have a right to their life, a right to their liberty, a right to keep the fruits of their labor. Because we were the freest nation in the world ever, uh, we were the most prosperous as well. And uh, now we are becoming much poorer because we have lost our way. We have concentrated on the material wealth that comes from freedom, thinking that if we just get the government to redistribute wealth and shut the shop with this around, we'll all be wealthy and happy. And we forgot about the fundamentals of what makes a free society. And this is what we have to restore. We have to understand what freedom is all about. Freedom comes to us as individuals. We get our life, our lives, and our liberties from our Creator. That's where it comes from, not from our government. The government should be there to protect that. And if the government gets out of the way, uh, we will be prosperous, and we were prosperous. This test of freedom that we had in this country was a small test for a couple hundred years. Freedom is nothing ancient. Totalitarianism is ancient. Every once in a while, they'll accuse me, and I'll bet you they've accused a few of you in this room if you defend it, and you say, 
Oh, you people who want free markets, you don't care about the poor, and you want to go back to the dark ages. Well, I'll tell you what, where the dark ages are is where the totalitarians are, and that's where we're moving. Just think of the number of pages in the Federal Register. Nobody could possibly read and understand these, and yet, through every presidency, they add thousands and thousands of more pages, thousands and thousands of bureaucrats running around regulating us, and most of these bureaucrats have guns. I don't believe, I believe, I don't believe your guns should be regulated, but I believe the guns of the bureaucrats ought to be regulated. The test we had, I thought it was very successful, but because we lost our way, we thought we could get something for free. But there's nothing for free. Now, people who uh, see their economic freedoms uh, threatened and understand, you know, low taxes, low regulations and all, how they could be prosperous again. But there's another part of freedom that I think that we have to be concerned about. After 9-11, we have been told incessantly that now, it's necessary to fact sacrifice your liberty to be safe. I don't believe that for one minute. You do not have to sacrifice your liberties or your privacy in order to be safe. There is an important part of our Constitution that we should know and understand that helps make you very safe. It's not because we have policemen at the front of our doors and policemen out on the streets doing their best, but they don't make you safe in your home. Probably the best safety feature that we have in this country is the clear understanding of the Second Amendment. In this age where we drifted away from believing in ourselves, and believing in freedom, and believing in the free market, and believing in, in, in sound money, we have also changed our ways uh, over these last hundred years in what our role in the world should be. I think it's a very important question to ask, and it's very important we come up with the right answer. And I have a precise answer for that. Because I don't like our role in the world today, because I think we have been endangered. I don't believe we or you should have to be the policemen in the world, sacrificing for the world. I think it's time to bring our troops home from around the world. It's an economic necessity, and actually I believe we'd be much stronger for it. I do not believe us being in 130 countries in having 900 bases around the world, being involved in entangling alliances, and interfering with internal affairs of other nations, I don't believe that does us one bit of good. Economically, economically bringing the troops home, think how quickly just bringing the troops home and having all the troops spend their money here in our home, instead of in Korea and Japan and Germany and the Middle East, it would be a benefit to us all. reason, especially since the World War I on, we have felt uh, very strong that we had to go. And most of the people who endorsed it was always for, you know, it's up to us. We are a good country. We are a great country. And we should impose our will on others and teach them how to be good Democrats and, and teach them how, how they should live. But the whole thing is, you can't do that with force. The only way you can spread our goodness is by setting a good, in, a good uh, example and get other countries to want to emulate us, then we can spread our goodness. <laughs> Generally speaking, the uh, presidential candidate that speaks for peace is very likely to win the candidacy. Last go around, who was seen as the peace candidate? Actually, it was Obama. And right after he was elected, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. It was magic. <laughs> but then he went and started three more wars. So, and didn't even ask the Congress about it. What did, uh, what did President Bush do? And he was a candidate in the year 2000. He was, uh, he was for uh, like criticizing the previous administration. He said he wants a humble foreign policy. He wants to stay out of the internal affairs of the nation. He wants to get out of this business of nation building. But what happened after that? All of a sudden, we were involved even more so. And, uh, and during the Korean War, 
uh, the peace candidate at that time was Eisenhower. A nothing Korea. We're not winning and we don't know what we're going to win. It was an undeclared war. So Eisenhower was elected. Same way with Nixon. He was elected because of the war started in the 60s to try to end that war. But I think the big problem is, is that we, as a people and as a Congress, have failed to follow the rules. We have been instructed, the law is explicit in the Constitution, we should not go to war without a declaration of war. Right. That is the <laughs> If a war is declared, we should know who the enemy is, we should all be behind it, the Congress should support it, the people should support it, we should go fight it and win it. That is essentially what happened with World War II. We were attacked, and Germany declared war against us in less than four years. Both those powerhouses militarily were, were, were defeated. And here we are because we don't know why we're in Afghanistan. We're not even sure why we're, we're in, 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 uh, in Iraq, or why we're bombing Pakistan, and why we're bombing Yemen, and why we were so involved, because it goes on endlessly. The one thing is, if you have declared war, you know who the enemy is, and you can win the wars and get them over and stay out of the unnecessary wars. That, to me, is so important. <laughs> Most great nations get tempted to spread themselves too much around the world, even in ancient times. And it's usually those foreign interventions that brings those countries down, uh, down to their knees. That is exactly what happened with the Soviet system. I was drafted in the military in the 1960s during the Cold War, and um, that that Cold War, uh, you know, ended. But it did, and we didn't have to fight all those nuclear weapons. Just think, the Soviets had like 40,000. We have 30 some thousand nuclear warheads. Today, we fret more of the possibility of one nuclear weapon going into somebody's hands someday. And we want to start a war over that, and yet we were able to stand down the Soviets. But how did we win that? We won it in a way by default because the Soviets brought themselves down. They had a flawed economic system, and they went into no other place other than Afghanistan and got bogged down. You'd think we'd learn a lesson. And if we don't learn it soon, we're going to get bogged down, and we're going to come home, and we'll. I will win this argument about bringing the troops home, but unfortunately it will be under more dire circumstances. But that generally what happens in history is, is countries spread themselves too, too, too much around and then they uh, have to go into bankruptcy. It is a big economic issue. There are estimates now that the wars in the Middle East uh, since 1971 is up to uh, $3 trillion and climbing. And that isn't even counting all the tragedies. All you have to do is read the stories about uh, the tragic uh, results of, uh, of service people coming home uh, without arms and legs and visions and brain injuries and the deaths that have been involved. And, and we don't even know exactly why. I, I, would, uh, I am also convinced that we are more threatened by being over there. We are not less threatened. I cannot buy this argument that if we go over there and kill a lot of people, many times innocent people, that it's going to make us safer here at home. I think that what is, we should take the advice of the founders, we should take the advice of Eisenhower and other Republicans and say, look, non-entangling alliances, get along with people, trade with people, and try to be friends with as many people as possible. And one way I would stop the entangling alliances is why, why in the world do we have to be entangled in the United Nations and NATO and having them dictate to us when we go to war? I get out of those. Yeah. Randolph Moore, who wrote during World War I, wrote a book called uh, War is the Health of the State. I believe that. War engenders, you know, a patriotic fervor and a willingness to sacrifice the liberties. And we've been doing that these last 10 years with the uh, so-called war on, on terror. But what I see as the great danger is when the state grows, the war atmosphere and attitude allows the state to grow, undermining our personal, personal liberties. And that's where I think we're really losing it and we have to understand it. There's a lot of support still. In, uh, in Washington and around the country for the Patriot Act. 
I don't think the Patriotic has had anything. This doesn't mean we shouldn't have security and watch and things, but there are different ways of doing it than making you, uh, every place you go, look like a possible terrorist. That doesn't help. That punishes you because it doesn't get the terrorists. So I would say that it's time we re-look this whole thing that's going on at the airports, re-look this Patriot Act, and make sure your privacy is protected, and make sure if there's a whistleblower telling us what's going on in our government, whether it's in the military or whether it's in the financial community, that they are not treated like the scumbags that they generally are. We want to know what the government is doing. That's our job. We want our liberty back, and we want government to be accountable. Well, it all sounds good, but where are you going to cut? And how is this going to work? Uh, there's uh, so many people to be taken care of. I have adopted a, a philosophy where if you want to work your way out, you can. Sometimes I don't think we're going to be able to. But we ought to have transitions. We ought to know whether, let's say on medical care. There was a good slogan when Obamacare came out. Uh, some wanted to repeal it, which I voted against and would. But at least... You want to have the right to opt out of it if you don't like it. To be forced into something like this that's going to bankrupt our country, it shouldn't be that way. You should have the right to a medical saving account and assume responsibility for yourself. And I think we should have that all the time. In education, we should have that option. In education, now we've moved in the wrong direction. The quality of education has gone down and skyrocketed in, in cost. So what has happened in the last 50, 60 years? Federal governments come in. Now, where, where in the Constitution does the federal government get the authority to run our public school system? There's a, there, the Constitution does not prohibit the public school system by the states, but it does not give the authority for the federal government to interfere. So we ignored the Constitution, we created this monster department of education, and uh, quality of education goes down. Now, why I see it so bad is not, not only because it costs a lot and you get bad education, is why did we, all of us, allow our government to do that without changing the Constitution? If you want this public, if you want the government in, in public education, amend the Constitution. But if you can ignore the Constitution and allow the government to do that, what other part of the Constitution is worth anything to us? That's what's happened to the war power resolution, the, the war power, because we just allowed presidents since. since uh, uh, Truman went to war under a UN resolution in 1950. Uh, we've ignored that. So what? Uh, once you allow that to happen, the Constitution is out the window, and I'm afraid that's where we are today. I believe most of our problems have come because we have had not had the individuals in Washington and the determination of their American people and to send those individuals that would obey the law of the land. And that, I believe, is where the answers can be found. If we got into this mess in foreign policy or monetary policy or spending policy or violation of our civil liberties because we don't follow the oath of office, why wouldn't the solution be sending only people to Washington who know and understand what the Constitution says and you believe they'll uphold their oath of office? subject of monetary policy, uh, uh, there's no authority for the Federal Reserve. They mess things up and people are starting to realize it. They created a monstrous system around the world because we've been issuing paper money with the reserve currency of the world. All other currencies build on our paper money. But this, uh, this is not going to be easy to change. It's likely it's going to blow up in our face. And that is with runaway inflation, this whole thing comes apart and that will be very, very dangerous. But in the meantime, it would be very difficult just to take the key and turn it and, uh, and close the Fed down. There's too much that depends on it. So what I would like to do, and I have a bill that would do this and would promote this and like it, and that is to uh, allow competition. Competition with what? Like American silver dollars and American gold dollars. Just use them. Today, if you do it, you could end up going to jail. There's been a couple who have tried it. If you try to use gold and silver, you go to jail. And they say they're counterfeiting. Well, who's the counterfeiters? It's the Federal Reserve or the counterfeiters. Yeah. And then they want to do it in secret. 
trip. This is the reason why if we ever exposed them, I think it would come to an end. That is why I work so hard trying to get an audit of the Federal Reserve to find out what they're doing. Created and, and, and generated $15 trillion worth of uh, credits that they passed out. They don't want us to know where it went. Now, with some effort, we didn't get a full audit of the Fed, but we got partial audits and we've learned a little bit. $15 trillion that they messed around with, a third of it went to foreign banks. They failed out foreign banks. And no wonder they don't want us to know what's going on. They believe in globalism. Well, <laughs> I don't think we should be suckers forever. I think, I think one day we're going to wake up and say enough is enough. And we need to be prepared. Because whether the monetary system, whether we can work our way out, or whether the currency collapses, whether we can bring our troops home systematically, or whether we have to do it because we're flat out broke, or whether we can uh, repeal the Patriot Act or when people finally rebel against what's happening. But, we have a lot of work to do. It's a big job. Our freedoms are on the line. And this is at a crucial stage. Now, the problems are great. The economic problems are great. Personal liberty is under attack. The foreign policy is in shambles. But believe it or not, as I travel the country, and especially when I go to the universities, I end up a bit of an optimist. I think a lot of people are waking up. There are a lot of people waking up. Uh, to, to the fact that we have overdone it and we have answers. We have answers not because Ron Paul thought of these answers. I haven't created any new ideas. I present them because I've heard them and put them together and try to make freedom a single message that personal liberty and economic liberties are all in one thing and that trade is important and friendship put together. But that came from somebody else. But those answers are there. And young people especially, and people like you that come out to hear me, uh, you're at least paying attention and listening and know the answers are there. So I'm optimistic that we are laying the groundwork for this. And to tell you the truth, I've been surprised and impressed how rapidly things have moved in the direction of emphasizing liberty in the last four years. I never dreamed that this would happen so quickly out of need. It's not my great speeches, I know my shortcomings. <laughs> but it's out of the need. But it is a fantastic message. There's no doubt about it. The message of liberty is the message of America. The message of prosperity comes from the message and the understanding of property rights and free markets and sound money. And that is available to us in like to no other country. But if we're careless, we could lose it. We could go into a dark age because this is a worldwide phenomenon. Everybody knows the world's in trouble. I mean, uh, Greece is in trouble, but America's in trouble for the same reason. Everybody believed that they could print money, run up debt, and always get bailed out. But there is a limit. And the only solution, I say, is emphasizing once again the principles of liberty. But to emphasize it, you have to understand what it means. Because it does mean that there are obligations if you want to be truly free. You might want your right to life and your liberty and do what you want. And if you mess up, oh, I'll go and get on a government program. It doesn't work that way. If you want your right to your life, to live your life as you choose, make your choices in uh, economic matters, make your choices in intellectual matters, make your choices in your spiritual matters, but also in your personal habits. Why, why is it that if we grant people the right to understand the First Amendment to make these crucial questions about our eternity and our intellectual uh, opportunities as well as economics, why is it that we just don't say, your life is your own? You should make your own choices. What happens is there will be some that will make mistakes. But what happens when government makes up the, all the decisions? What they do is they say, we're going to watch what you put in your mouth and what you smoke. And then what happens to people? Then, they, then there's a discovery and a, a, and a realization that actually some people can be held by smoking marijuana. People have been known to be helped with cancer and chemotherapy. So states come in and they legalize it. They legalize it and say, for medicinal reasons. And the federal government comes in with a heavy hand and arrests sick people. And if they've been charged three different times, they could end up in prison for life. We have the biggest prison population in the world. Most of them are related to this drug war that has been a total failure. And it's time we just woke up. They woke up in the 30s and said, you know, 
prohibition doesn't work. We're sick and tired of Al Capone. We're sick and tired of the drug dealers, and we're sick and tired of all the killing. Tens of thousands of people being killed on our borders to the south over the drug war. So all we have to do is wake up, because it's nothing more than an excuse to further attack our personal liberties. But you have to assume the responsibility. If you have a right to make these decisions, then you, you have the obligation to suffer the consequences. But just think when government makes the decisions, then we all suffer. But one of the silliest parts about the drug war has been this issue of hemp. Hemp, we used to, we used to uh, subsidize and encourage and pay people to raise hemp in World War II because it was a, such a great product. And uh, the truth is, if you want to get high on a hemp, hemp, you have to have a cigar as big as a phone pole. I mean, <laughs> but we're not allowed to, if you grow hemp, you can be arrested by the federal government. And if you live on the, uh, I understand we're close to a state line. So if you know, know somebody across the river that will sell you raw milk and you happen to think raw milk might help you, you don't even have the right to go over there and buy raw milk. Now, I know most people don't drink raw milk, but I know some, most people, most of us should. And the reason why I'm interested, I'm interested in your freedom of choice. So yes, their intentions are good. They're going to keep people from having bad habits. But let me tell you, freedom of choice is very important. Think of all those issues that you might find controversial. Think, the First Amendment isn't there to protect non-controversial speech. It isn't there so we can talk about the weather. The First Amendment there is for us to say controversial things. It protects all of us. And hopefully we can keep that protection and we can keep talking. But I want to apply that across the board. That consistency is very necessary to bring people together. Kind of like freedom is a very popular idea and it brings people together because it's not, not threatening. I mean, we don't have religious arguments when we elect our, uh, our candidates because we're not going to pick and choose religion. But uh, when you expand that explanation, what we do is we bring people together. They act differently, look different, have different habits, and, and, uh, and nobody's judgmental as long as they don't hurt other people. You cannot, governments can't write enough laws to protect you against yourself. Before you know it, they're going to be telling us how much salt we can put on our food in restaurants and, and how many soft drinks you're allowed to have, and the whole works. So I'm arguing the case for allowing liberty to live, to allow people to make their own choices, to get the confidence back that we once had. They didn't have debates quite like this once they got rid of the British Empire. But in this century, it has come up, and more so recently. We need our confidence back. We need you say, oh, no, no, who's going who's to take care of the people who fall through the cracks? Well, who's going to take care of them now? The cracks were wide open. Nobody took care of the people who lost their houses and lost their jobs. So there has to be a different system. There has to be a different way of doing it. Well, those are just a few of the things I believe rather strongly in. I got interested in uh, economics in the 60s and ran first in the 1970s because I expected to see someday what's happening today, that we'd spend ourselves into uh, <coughs> oblivion. And uh, today, though, uh, we're in the middle of a campaign. It's a very important campaign. And next week, of course, uh, the Ames Straw Vote is coming up. If you're willing to participate in that, your one vote is very significant because it's a small, uh, a small number of people who vote, kind of comparatively speaking, because it's a nationally known uh, straw vote, that it has great deal of significance. So if you find that the views of liberty are something that you endorse and would like to see promoted, for us to do well at Ames is very, very important. To do badly at Ames is not very encouraging. <laughs> it won't be encouraging. But I feel good about what's happening. We came here four years ago. We didn't know, it, know exactly what we were doing. The message was the same. This time, the organization is better. And more people are listening because it's a greater need. So if you find it uh, to your benefit to come, it's not to benefit me so much as if you believe these views that need to be promoted and eventually people like myself and myself be elected, 
Dan, we need you at Ames. We need you to bring somebody to Ames because it will make all the difference in the world. Your vote is like worth 100 to 300 people when you consider the uh, whole scope of thing when uh, it's such a small community of people that are voting. So I want to thank you very much for coming, and uh, I'm sorry I didn't get to sing my song, but that's my song. I sung my message of liberty, and I'm just delighted you're here, and hopefully I see you all at Ames. Thank you very much. like a message you'd like to hear from the White House? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're looking at history here. Uh, Congressman Paul's voting record, he, he literally is the Thomas Jefferson of our day. So arriving in Ames, Iowa, having a great turnout is great for him, it's great for you, it's great for the cause of liberty, so please show up and do that. Raise your hand. David Fisher over here has a microphone, and he will bring it to you if you have a question. Uh, we have a gentleman uh, back here to the left. David. Check, check. Thanks. Hi, Congressman. Had uh, um, our uh, mic is up at the podium. Would that be okay? Would well, you mind using that? Yeah, and also, uh, if you would announce your name sure. and, and what uh, organization you're from. Sure. It's just you won't. Hi, Congressman. I'm John David from uh, WQAD in, in Moline, Illinois. And just had a quick question about the uh, death ceiling. Uh, from what I read in your statement, uh, you believe that they will uh, just encourage more spending and not reduce the deficit. Could you uh, talk a little bit of your thoughts on the votes the past few days? Okay, his question about uh, my vote against the debt ceiling increase. I think if a person is in debt in a serious manner, uh, getting more debt doesn't help. It seems to me like it would make the problem worse. Uh, so, <laughs> and also because I never voted for an appropriation bill, I was worried in the 1970s we were spending too much money and I wanted to set an example we don't vote for these things trying to balance our budget. But also there were some other things there, the debt limit increase, but this setting up of this commission, uh, that is worrisome. I mean, what? Where did that come from? It didn't come from the Constitution. And they're going to have legislative clout, and they will be taken. A lot of uh, authority will be taken out of the hands of the Congress. As inept as we have been, the answers for inept Congresses is to get rid of the Congress, not to have a super Congress on on top of it. So I uh, I had no problems voting against that because I think it was an artificial day. I think August second was artificial. Uh, I didn't think for a minute that and our country will not stop sending the checks out. Uh, they will happen. But the default is going to happen. We're bankrupt. I want everybody to admit we're bankrupt. And the default is coming by the devaluation of the currency. And I talked about that's what we have to understand. That devaluation of the currency may take a little longer. It may be delayed. But it's much more dangerous because there's a much greater chance of political chaos. And another question from the media. Congressman Paul, my name is Todd McGreevy with the River Cities Reader newspaper here in Quad Cities. When you said that uh, we don't need the Federal Reserve or the Federal Income Tax, uh, what do you say to those that believe we need Federal Income Tax to run our government? And I have a follow-up question about the Federal Reserve as well. Well, you, you, you do need an income tax if you want to run the government at the size it is. I want to shrink the size of the government. We didn't have it up until 1913. We did okay. So if you have a constitutional government, you don't need an income tax. And the Federal Reserve, uh, there's no authority for it, and they, the evidence is uh, clear that they've messed things up. Uh, just think of how many business cycles and economic problems we've had since 1913. We had, we had the inflation for World War I, the Depression of 1921, the disaster of the 1930s. That's all a consequence of the business cycle coming from the Federal Reserve. So we don't, uh, we don't need the Federal Reserve. We need somebody to defend the integrity of our monetary unit. We need an honest currency that is provided in our Constitution. So you do not need a Federal Reserve, although the world is engulfed with central banking, Believe me, 
it is going to be, uh, uh, you know, under serious attack. Matter of fact, many internationalists agree with exactly what I'm saying. What are they planning to do? They're planning to set up a new currency under the United Nations. And I said we should say, no way should we have that happen. Question two. Is there a sunset on the Federal Reserve's charter? They were formed in 1913. Is it a hundred year charter? Or how does that work? No, I, I, if there is, I, I don't remember reading. No, I don't believe there's a sunset that would come up by now. But uh, a lot of, there's a lot of confusion on the Federal Reserve because many people say, oh, it's private. And uh, there's a private entity involved because the uh, member banks, the regional banks, and all banks are interwoven, interwoven with, uh, with the Federal Reserve and, and receive some, uh, some, some benefits. But I don't think of it as being private in the sense of a private company. It's private in the sense that private individuals benefit of it, private individuals influence who runs the Federal Reserve, and it just happens that there's a certain firm, I think it's called Goldman Sachs or something, <laughs> seems, to, seems to get all the appointments at Treasury and have their influence in the, uh, in the Federal Reserve. But it was, it's a creature of Congress. Congress is a creature of the people. And when the people wake up and say, we don't want it any longer, the Congress can change it, and they can repeal the act or amend the act. Unfortunately, we've had a tough time even finding out what they're doing, but we're making some progress on that. Additional questions from the media? We have a gentleman in the back, David. I'm sorry. Lady in the back. <laughs> in the microphone. Hi, um, my name is Whitney Lemming. I'm a writer for the Black Hawk newspaper at Davenport Central High School, and I write a column based on education. We have, you know, all this uh, stuff going on about the economy and everything, but as a student, my personal interest lies within the educational system, and right now, what we all know that it's kind of not doing so hot right now. I mean, our ratings are in national tests is crashing, and also uh, schools are closing. And I would just like to know, instead of what we've been doing lately by pointing fingers at teachers in 10 years. What do you plan to do about education to make it better for us? I, I gather the question is, is education is a mess, they have financial problems, they have teacher problems, what am I going to do about this as a president? I would work very, very hard to return all the financing, regulations, and control back to the states. we spend at the Department of Education goes to help bureaucrats, doesn't go to help education. So it, it doesn't accomplish what it's supposed to do. I, as, as much as money is needed, and I understand that, and, but money is not the major issue in our problem in our schools. Because I know individuals who still believe in the responsibility that parents have for teaching their kids, and they don't send their kids to public school, they still pay their school taxes, and they educate their kids at home. And sometimes, like, Five hundred dollars, or and and the kids get a better education. So it's not money. Now, where what city do we have where the federal government does have a responsibility? That's Washington D.C. And there's the strictest laws against drugs and violence, and they get the most money. I think it's seventeen thousand dollars per kid, and it's in shambles. So they come over to Congress and they say, you know what, we need is more money. <laughs> well, I don't buy into that because I don't think it's a money issue. And I don't think the problems are easy. But you say, well, you've taken all this money, you send it to Washington, and now you're saying the states have to take care of themselves. But I would be taking a lot less of your money. And it would be in the states, it would be up to the states to deal with it. And the most important thing is to always have competition so that you can. Competition is good. You don't have to be against public schools, but you've got to have competition. And that is if you force everybody into that system, whether it's a medical system or an educational system, I think that's very detrimental. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, we'll take two questions from the audience uh, to keep on schedule today. Uh, we'll go with the gentleman in the front row here. Um, my name is Joe Cherby. I'm from uh, New York, Minnesota. Drove down this morning. Uh, my question to you is, uh, 
How do you feel uh, Fox News has treated you uh, this time around? <laughs> I'll answer that for you. You ask uh, how I think Fox News has been treating me compared to four years ago. Uh, much better. <laughs> but they also understand the marketplace. <laughs> you know, uh, after, after the crisis hit, uh, and we weren't in the campaign mode, uh, you know, I couldn't handle all the phone calls. And uh, it because it's of more interest to them. But no, uh, I think last go around, uh, once in Iowa, once in New Hampshire, right before important uh, votes, uh, I was excluded from the debates. But that's not happening. And uh, I, uh, you never, politicians never get a really fair shake. You know, we always have to complain a bit. But uh, no, I think uh, I think the treatment of the media in general has been been quite fair and that uh, <coughs> treated me uh, more fairly than they did in the past. Okay, we have a question in the back. We'll make David work all the way back with a waving hand on the yellow shirt. indirect in the sense that the healthier and the freer our economy is and the wealthier we are the more likelihood is is that you can take care of sending more money to other charities when you do it through the government there's also wars almost inevitably there'll be war factions go there if you send money it's a weapon a war of weapon even if you send food it becomes a weapon of war and you get involved, no matter how sympathetic you might feel. The greatest thing that we could do for these nations that suffered from starvation is to introduce them to the ideas that I've been talking about. Because that's where prosperity comes from. But to, we're in big trouble now in this country for me to put a greater burden. Let's say, let's say there's a billion dollar program that's sent up there and it's going to feed some people over there. Well, I'll print up the money. And then that just adds more to the problems that I was talking about. It won't solve the problem. Uh, this, this is the challenge, I think I said it in my speech, is that uh, this humanitarian element, that we get blamed, we get, they say, oh, you have no humanitarian concerns, you don't care about the poor people. I'll tell you what, if you really care about the poor people, what you have to do is spread the message of liberty and property rights. And then you get and set good examples. And then if there is prosperity, the likelihood of a voluntary effort is going to be much more likely to be successful than if government to government aid. That is not like people to people aid. There's a big difference. Thank you all for coming. That is uh, the conclusion of our question and answer period. Uh, at this time, I do want to remind everybody that straw poll tickets are available out in the hall. And if you would please stay in your seats for just a moment, uh, we're going to get Congressman Paul outside into the uh, uh, kind of the hallway out there. But he needs to work his way through. So if you would please.